Hey folks, Quilly Team here and welcome to Let's Try Lords of Waterdeep. Lords of Waterdeep is a real life board game that also has a digital adaptation. For a long time it was only available on mobile devices, but now it has come to Steam and it is available for Windows and the Mac. Um, the the PC-ish version here is basically the same as the mobile version, but I haven't really noticed any problems with that. There was maybe a couple extra sort of clicks for confirming things that you might be able to smooth away um, if it was a fully PC-centric UI, but I get really irritated by UI issues normally, and I'm actually not bothered by, by anything that I've noticed. I've noticed it sort of from an academic point of view, but that's about it. I, I actually find it's a perfectly good version for the PC, so kudos to the developers um, behind this thing. Now, settings menu, relatively plain, but that's all we've got. It is worth noting you can access the rulebook in-game here, as well as the card library, so you can actually um, check and know all the different things that exist in the game ahead of time, you know, use it as as a reference for whatever. Really good little reference here. Um, really enjoy that quite a bit. Everything sort of smacks of like relatively high quality here. So again, Lords of Waterdeep is a real life board game. Normally it's uh, playable with up to five players. If you get the expansion, you can play it with up to six. The expansion also adds uh, a couple of optional modules. Those are available as a DLC here on Steam or on mobile devices. Um, in real life, it's one box set that's got the two modules in it. Here, they've split it into two smaller and cheaper expansions, um, the Undermountain and Skullport. I will not be playing with those in my demo game today, just to keep it a little bit more simple. And you don't need these, definitely, to play it and enjoy it. They are very good expansions with some cool features, but they definitely add a lot more stuff. Uh, and probably not the way you want to start uh, initially. I have not played online, so I can't comment on that one way or the other. You can play offline here. Uh, you can you can still tune your, your profile over here so that you can check your, your various stats and, and whatever. I've mostly been playing on my laptop, so there's not a heck of a lot here over here. And uh, yeah, so you can create more profiles if you want. You can rename yourself and you can select an avatar, which may not matter as much for a single player. On the other hand, it's still cool. So we're gonna go ahead and create the game. I will note the tutorials here are quite good. Um, I, again, I finished them on my uh, my laptop here. Uh, probably take you 10 minutes to finish the core tutorials over here. And that's really all you need. Um, although if you do get the expansions, it might be worth watching these two so you find out about a couple of new things. So we're gonna create a game over here. Um, you can, again, if you have the expansions, you can toggle them on and off. And if you play with the expansions, you can have a sixth player in there as well. Um, so you can play from two to five players in, in the base game here. Uh, more players, uh, more or less players is sort of balanced mechanically because this is at its core a worker placement game and you will get more workers to place if there are fewer players um, and, and vice versa just to uh, try to keep the amount of actions played relatively consistent. Um, AI comes in three different flavors. You can also play with a uh, hot seat over here so you can have multiple human players in here there's not a whole lot of hidden information in this game so the hot seat sort of thing isn't too bad the most important thing that you will want to hide from each other is probably which secret masked lord you are playing as um and technically i think intrigue cards are normally hidden but i don't think it's actually a terrible thing if they um if you see each other's intrigue cards and at least you know everyone will see each other's intrigue cards it doesn't really change anything much most of the game is is quite visible um and public information normally so let's go ahead with this with the average ai i'll probably get my ass kicked because it's hard to think and especially math and optimize um while you're talking but we're gonna do our best this is just the setup phase over here i'm gonna wait for that to finish uh oh and i actually got first player good luck now, this is a Euro-style board game, which means um, not a ton of randomness, as well as not a ton of direct interaction with other players. So, let's talk about um, what we have, okay? We're going to talk about our tavern to start off with. So, over on the left-hand side of the screen here is my tavern. This is referred to, this is, this is your stuff as your player. It's a tavern. Lords of Waterdeep is a game set in Dungeons and Dragons, specifically the Dungeons and Dragons world of the Forgotten Realms. Um, and Waterdeep is one of the big, big cities in the Forgotten Realms. It's known as the City of Splendors. And it is ruled by some masked lords. They hide their identity in meetings with masks. And they're often scheming and bickering with each other. And that's what you're playing here. Now, you don't have to know anything at all about Dungeons and Dragons 
or or Forgotten Realms or Waterdeep to play this game. None at all. But it is a great, great flavor uh, to to couch the mechanics in. Uh, really helps to sell the game concept. I think it feels good. But again, you don't need any previous knowledge about that, other than it's a you know it's a fantasy sort of setting, and there you have it. So and of course in fantasy sort of things in Dungeons and Dragons adventures, they always start in a tavern because that's just the way it is. Now. In normal Dungeons & Dragons, you play as an adventurer in a party of adventurers going out to complete quests. Here, you are playing as the secret powers behind the scenes that are hiring adventurers to go complete quests for them. So in your tavern, your five base uh, resources are gold, over here, and then you've got four different types of adventurers. You've got priests, you've got warriors, you've got rogues, and you've got mages here. And you're going to complete quests by accumulating adventurers of the correct type and then spending those adventurers to complete some quests. Down below, you've got the cards that you control. Here is the quests that I possess over here. Each player gets two quests handed out to them randomly. Uh, you're, there's no penalty to not completing them, but completing quests is the primary way that you earn victory points. And the winner at the end of the game is the person with the most victory points. So here's an example of a quest. It is a commerce type quest. There's five different categories. Commerce, Skullduggery, which is like, you know, thievy kind of stuff, Warfare, Piety, and Arcana. Um, so this quest is called Bribe the Shipwrights. To complete this quest would require four rogues and one mage and four gold. The reward would be 10 victory points. We'll deal with the rest of the stuff later on. But that's the basic gist of the game. You're going to mostly want to accumulate adventurers so you can complete quests and score points. Um... As far as I know, there's no limit to how many quests you can have in your in your hand over here, waiting at your uh, your um, your tavern. For maybe there is a limit. I don't know. I haven't looked at the uh, the, the game rules that closely. But I've never played it in real life. I've only played this digital version here um, and watched uh, Will Wheaton play it on tabletop one time. Uh, so there's that. There, there's more quests that we can grab over here, and actually you're going to be you know processing a lot of different quests over here over the course of the game. We've also got intrigue cards, and we're going to talk about those a little bit later. This third pile over here, this is for your completed quests, so you can keep track of them. Finally, down at the bottom left, we have our agents. These are the workers we will be placing on the board to take actions. Every action you take in most worker placement games, including Lords of Waterdeep here, are simply accomplished by taking one of your agents and placing it somewhere on the board. You then do whatever that square is, and that's your turn. Then it goes to the next player, and once everyone has run out of agents, the round ends. The game is played over a total of eight rounds, and at that point, the scores are totaled up. On round number five, everyone gets an extra agent to place as well. So it's worth noting that. And again, the number of start agents you start with, uh, I think in a two or three player game, I think you start with three agents each. Four and five player game, you start with two. Um, although if you have the expansions and you play the, the so-called long game, then uh, I think you start with an extra agent above that. That's not particularly important. Okay, what kind of stuff can you do with your agent? Well, um, the four basic moves you could do is you could place an agent at either the Field of Triumph, Blackstaff Tower, Grinning Lion Tavern, or the Plinth. And these are very basic because they give you adventurers. Uh, the Field of Triumph will give you two warrior cubes, the orange cubes. The Grinning Lion Tavern will give you two rogue cubes. The Plinth will give you one priest, and the Blackstaff Tower will give you one mage. You can already tell uh, warriors and rogues are more common than mages and priests or clerics over here. Uh, you can also go to Roar's Realm Shop over here to get four gold. Very, very simple and straightforward. Uh, the other three, or the other four actions, I could say, um, there's a little bit more to say to them. Castle Waterdeep, if you put uh, an agent here, that will give you the first player token. It means the next round you will start first. It will also let you draw an Intrigue card. Again, we haven't talked about those Intrigue cards over here. It will give you an Intrigue card, add it to your hand. Um, the Builder's Hall over here lets you build a building. Uh, there are always three buildings visible over here. You put your agent here, you pay the amount of gold that you can see in the top left corner over here, the cost, and then this building belongs to you. When someone builds a building, it gets added to the board, and all of a sudden it's another location that anyone can deploy an agent to. That's right, anyone. If I were to build the three pearls, one of my opponents could play their agent 
on the three pearls and use its ability. In this case, uh, the three pearls ability is you return two cubes of any type and get three cubes of any type. Uh, and you can mix and match these. So you could return, say, one warrior and one rogue and get like two wizards and a priest or, or whatever you would prefer. Um, so if I build this, my opponents can use this. And it's like, well, what's the point? Well, the point is the owner, whoever built this, when an opponent uses their location, they get a bonus. They get paid. So I would get two gold, not from my opponent, just from the bank, but I would get two gold every time someone uses this. If I use my own building, I don't get the owner bonus, but that's okay. The other thing that's worth noting is that buildings have these victory points on them. These are actual tokens. Every round, at the start of every round, you put one victory token on each building. So if a building's been around for a while and no one's been buying it, it's going to be worth two, three, four, five victory points as the game goes on. Um, and it can be quite lucrative that way as well. Um, so that's the buildings. Uh, Waterdeep Harbor, if you play an agent here, you get to play, you can see play, an Intrigue card. So you get to play one of the Intrigue cards from your hand. Now, Intrigue cards are nice, but they're not super powerful, and they might not seem worth an action, spending a whole action to play one of these cards. Well, the funky thing is, at the end of the round, after everyone's played all their agents, anyone who's played an agent at Waterdeep Harbor, you pick up your agent, and then play it somewhere else. So you sort of get to use this agent twice. Now, um, there's three spots in Waterdeep Harbor. Most of the locations can only fit one agent. If someone goes to Blackstaff Tower, no one else can go to Blackstaff Tower this round. But three people can go to Waterdeep Harbor, and you pick up your agents in order. So the, the person in the one slot is the first person to pick up an agent and then play it again. So by the time you get to the third one, there's not a lot of locations left, but it can still be worth uh, quite a bit. You know, you get sort of two actions, and some of these Intrigue cards are very, very, very handy. Um, the final spot you can go to is Cliff Watch Inn. Cliff Watch Inn is where you pick up quests. All three of these spots, and you can go in either, in any of these three locations in Cliff Watch Inn, and, you know, up to three agents can ultimately be placed here over the set of a round, all of them will result in you picking up a quest. The first slot here lets you pick up a quest and get two gold. The second slot lets you pick up a quest and get an intrigue card. And the third slot takes all of these quests over here, discards them, puts four new quests out, and then you grab a quest from the new set of four. And again, quests are your primary way of completing, of, of accumulating rewards or um, victory points. Now, each player has a secret Lord of Waterdeep that they represent. We picked up Nindal Jalbuk over here. Um, and Nindal Jalbuk gets four bonus victory points for each piety or skullduggery quest that mm, she? Man of the people. That he completes. Um, so Nindal, as, as Nindal, I'm going to want to focus on piety and skullduggery if I can. So everyone's got one of these hidden lords. Most of them do this, where you get four bo bonus points for two different types of quests. The type of the quest is at the top over here. But there are a couple of exceptions. For example, one of the lords gets six bonus victory points for every building they own at the end of the game. One part of the game is trying to figure out who everyone might be playing as a lord, because you might be able to sort of block and counter what they do. I don't know if the AI is really going to be able to determine um, exactly what I'm going for over here and optimize about this. Now, I have to focus on Piety and Skullduggery Quest requests for bonus points. Skullduggery Quest requests tend to require a lot of rogues. Piety quests tend to require a lot of priests. So I will be focusing on picking that up. Uh, priests are a little harder to come by than, than, than rogues, for example. So this quest needs five and a couple of bucks, but it's worth 25 freaking victory points. It's huge. Huge. This one's only worth 10, although it does re reward me with six gold as well. So that's kind of handy dandy. So finally, let's, you know, we're 10 minutes, 14 minutes in. Excellent. I'm going to make my first move. So I will also check to see what quests we have here. We actually are lucky enough to start with one Skullduggery quest over here, which needs a fair amount of money. We've also got this Commerce quest. Um, whoa! Which I don't need Commerce quests. Like, I don't get any bonus rewards from this, but... It is a plot quest. Plot quests have a ongoing effect after you complete them. And this is actually quite handy because whenever I take an action that gives me any gold, I also get a rogue, which is going to be good for me because I need rogues. So 
So, I think I'm going to start. I'm going to focus on trying to complete this as early as possible. So, I need some rogues and a mage for this. So, I think I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to grab the rogue location right away. The Grinning Lion Tavern will give me two rouges. Uh, let's actually just double check. What are my actual intrigue cards? Ambush. Each opponent loses a warrior. And each opponent that could not do so, I get a warrior. Actually, if I'm going first... I got three opponents. None of them will have warriors because they haven't gone. If I play this right now, I will get three warriors from one action. And again, I'll get to place him a second time. There's also conscription, which is another way to get um, some warriors, but not as much. Now, I don't need... I will need some warriors over the course of the game. I think I'm quite pleased with starting with this action. I'm going to go ahead and do the ambush. We'll get three warriors for one action. This is going to confirm that none of my opponents can play a warrior. And I'll get to use that agent again, right? That's the other thing, too. That's that's the real bonus. Um, oh, this person played Call for Adventurers to be able to get um, uh, two wild cards. So we I used it to get two wizards. But each opponent gets to pick one wild card as well. Now, because wizards and priests are harder to come by, I think I'd rather grab one of those. I do need priests overall, but I do need one wizard to complete bribe the shipwrights over here. So I'm going to go ahead and grab the wizard um, cube right now. So I'm moving closer and closer to completing that first quest. Plus I'm going to need some for takeover rival organization as well. Bidding war is fun. Whoever plays it, you draw one quest for every player. The person who played it gets to pick first and then everyone else in order gets to pick one. Um, I'm going to go ahead and grab this skullduggery quest over here because obviously we need that. Whenever you take an action that provides any rogues, also take two money. All right, these plot quests often aren't worth quite as many victory points, but getting them early like this is really nice because you can develop a bit of an engine. Uh, I'm going to commit to that decision. All right, people are picking up quests. So for my second agent, um, I don't think I want to play the conscription card here. Um, I, no, there's no spots in the Waterdeep Harbor anyway. I'm just going to go to the Grinning Lion Tavern, get myself a couple of rouges here and start moving towards some of these quest completions. I wonder if, like, I might want to prioritize one over the other. I don't know if it makes a difference. Ah! Someone just built the first building, House of the Moon. And someone went ahead and played on it immediately. So House of the Moon gives you one priest and lets you take a quest, gives, giving the owner two gold. Again, if the owner himself uses this, then they don't get the gold. We're at the end of the round. Everyone has placed all their agents. So now what we're doing is we're grabbing one at a time our agents from Waterdeep Harbor, and we will get to play them. I would have loved to pick up the, the Gone to the Plinth or the House of the Moon to get some priests because I will need some later on. Um, but, and I'm, hey, I'm piety, right? So there's not actually a quest here that I care about. I could just pick up I could pick up some more money, or I could pick up some, like, another mage, because I know I'm going to need a second one here. The other thing I could do is I could go and place a pawn over here, reset the quest board, and then pick up a quest, hopefully getting a piety or skullduggery. I think, though, I'm going to focus on making sure I'm in a good place to, like, maybe finish some of the ones I've got. We've got we're good on warriors. We know, yeah, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and just get a mage here. I think that's fine. Um, hold on. I'm also going to need more money to complete both of those. Now, I can do this next time. And, in fact, maybe get a bonus rogue out of it. But, no, you know what? I'm just going to go for the cash. I could finish this quest immediately. But I don't want to. Uh, it will give me four rogues back. Actually, hold on. That's really good. So if I complete this, I spend a warrior, two rogues, and a mage, and a bunch of money. Which is going to mean I'm not, I don't have enough money for these. But I get four rogues right away, and I do need more rogues. But then I won't have the money. Either way, next turn, I'm going to be forced to put a token down somewhere. I think I'll wait. I don't think There's no reason I have to complete this right away. I don't have to rush it. I don't think getting the rogues will help me that much. Next turn, I can probably pick up the extra rogues there, get my engine cards going on, and, and prioritize that. Alright, new turn. Oh, that's really unfortunate. So someone did play at Castle Waterdeep, taking the first player icon, and it's actually 
means I'm going to be last. Because, again, I'm basically here next to my opponents. By the way, I can click on the opponents over here and take a look at their taverns. So, again, most of the information is public. I can see what quests they have. I can know how many intrigue cards they have. I just don't know how uh, what they they are specifically. Um, I would like to go and do Castle Waterdeep at some point. But I'm going to I'm just going to soak not being in first. So, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to the Grinning Lion Tavern, get the extra rogues to be able to complete bribe the shipwrights and then my next action will hopefully be able to pick up money which will give me a free rogue from this so we're going to play this guy giving me 10 victory points as well but now if next turn if no one goes to aurora's realm shop it's going to be perfect because i'm going to go there get the free rogue next turn now, if someone does block me um, there, I might go to the House of the Moon, because I still need some priest, because I'll probably be looking to do some piety soon. Um, and uh, taking a quest would be nice. Nope, someone else is going there. That's fine. And they're taking the piety quest. Okay, who is this? That's Oberyn. So Oberyn is definitely stacking piety. The Skullduggery he may have just started with, but he's definitely stacking Piety, so he's probably doing Piety plus something else. I don't think there's a duplicate in terms of Piety and Skullduggery, so that's a little bit annoying, but luckily, I'm focusing heavily on Skullduggery right now, so I think it's going to be okay. Alright, so I'm going to go to Aurora's Realm Shop, which will give me four gold plus a rogue. Seems like good bang for our buck, and we are clearly going to need a lot of gold going forward, so I'm perfectly okay with doing this. And there we go, we got the free rogue, so we're going to go there. More buildings being built uh, by a separate player, so maybe no one's, you know, the builder yet. Northgate. Oh, that's oh, that's an interesting tile. If you put a pawn on here, you get a wild card and two gold, which is nice, but the owner gets two victory points. Building buildings is a great way to build up um, a base currency. And if there was one that would be really appropriate for us, again, the House of the Moon might have been okay. Uh, I might focus on that, although right now we really do need our gold to complete our quests. But it's nice when you keep getting sort of like some free bits over and over again. Uh, new Olam is actually really good for us. I mean, A, I want it to exist because, again, I want to get rogues and then it's two rogues plus a mage. So it's a nice little boost. But if someone else uses it, I can choose to get a rogue or a mage out of this as well. Now, I can't build it right now because the builder's hall is here. Um, I only have the one intrigue card. Someone's gone to the Grinning Line Tavern already, which means we don't actually have enough rogues. What I might do is I could go to Cliff Watch Inn, the one that lets you pick up an Intrigue card, use it to pick up the Skullduggery request. It's not a big reward, um, but it does cycle your, your priests, which wouldn't be terrible. Um, but get the Intrigue card, and then as my second action, play on Waterdeep Harbor, hopefully playing a good Intrigue card, and then seeing. That being said, the other thing I could do is I could use the Three Pearls. I could return a couple of Warriors and get, what, a bunch of Rogues? I don't think that's a very good efficiency thing. I think we actually will be looking to probably grab first player here. But I think I'm going to do that after using Waterdeep Harbor. So yeah, I kind of like this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to pick up this Skullduggery request. Um, I'm going to commit to the decision, which will then give me, that's actually great. Sample, the uh, sample wares intrigue card lets you put one of your guys on a building in the builder's hall as if I controlled it. So it will let me place a guy on new old, um, I'm not going to be able to do it this turn though, because I'm going to be placing one of my guys on Waterdeep Harbor and then I won't have any left. So next turn, I'll have to, as like maybe my first action, end up going to Waterdeep Harbor. Recall Agent is nice. lets you pick up one of your agents again. Um, so I guess I'm not going to Waterdeep Harbor, unless I want to play Conscription. I might want to just pick up some more gold. You know what? Let's do it. And we still get the uh, the extra rogue from it, which is going to be A-OK. -okay. And maybe next turn we can build something. But we're still... Well, someone else might take this first player, which I kind of hope, because, again, I'm last in the pile right here. This is not a fantastic setup. I'm feeling not great. 
Now, it's not unusual for one person to get a lot of early points. Um, some quests are, are easier to complete, and I mean, it's still... Well, he's got a frack ton of quests in his hand. This Oberyn guy is crushing face. I mean, if it weren't for him, I'd feel pretty good. But again, there can be a lot of late game scores. One of the things, though, we did complete two quests that don't give me a ton of victory points, but set up a bit of an engine. Man, these people are getting a lot of bonus crap going on. And completing more quests. A lot of people picking up those Skullduggery quests. Alright, there we go. Uh, Gritting Lion Tavern went again. Yeah, there's a lot of competition here. So here's what I think. We're going to go to the Builder's Hall right away. We're going to build new them. First, it's going to introduce more ways for me to get rogues. Um, and there's, But there's a good chance someone might beat me to playing this, but at least I'll still get the owner bonus here. Although, hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Instead of building it, which is still good, don't get me wrong, but this is actually a great opportunity for me to go ahead and play the sample wares over here. Put it on here, get the rogues, enabling me to complete a quest, uh, which is great because I really I want to get skull um, fence goods for the Duke of Darkness, the Ducka says, uh, which again is not a huge amount of victory points, but now gives me a money engine whenever I get some rogues. So let's go ahead and do that. So we've got both of our baselines sort of like I make money and get free rogues kind of system. We're gonna do that. Now, it is weird, this one action seemed to take two workers, but I will be able to get this worker back. So someone built Northgate. So he's going to play it and give victory points to Laryl, which is... I don't know, man. There's another thing here that'll give rogues. I would really like to build both of these, I think. So, I'm going to make sure I, start, I take starting player. As soon as Waterdeep Harbor tokens come back... I'm going to put it on Castle Waterdeep. We're going to get another Intrigue card. And we're going to take first player. And we are going to build these rogue buildings. Oh, I like Change of Plans. We might use that. Change of Plans Intrigue cards lets you ditch one of your non-completed quests. Get six uh, points for it. So, it is start of round five. We get an extra agent now. I am, in fact, going to start with the Builder's Hall. And I am... You know what I really want? Is I really want this one, in fact, as opposed to New Ulam. And the reason for that is, if I play on this building, I will get both an extra rogue, because I got gold, and extra gold, because I got a rogue. Eh? Not bad. Now, someone else might play on there. Oh, well. At least I still get the passive rogue from that. Um, it is worth noting, actually, I should have... Hold on, I maybe should have built Fet Look Court. Even though I don't need these things, it's worth five victory points just for building it right now. All right, someone did use my warehouse, which I would have preferred to use it myself, but at least I get the free rogue out of it. And... Um... I'm going to play... I don't know if I want to change the plan of these, actually. I mean, this is not the greatest quest, but it is Skullduggery. And there's not like there's a lot of options right now. We'll see. I'll, I'll hold off for now. Um, if I do use Northgate and I pick up a rogue, I will again, I will be able to get both types of things. It will give two victory points to uh, Laryl over here, but it's not like Laryl is doing particularly well. Not even a bunch of quests in hand. Not very valuable quest. Yeah, I think that's going to be perfectly okay, in fact. I'm going to go here. I'm going to grab a rogue. That will give me a rogue and gold, which will trigger both my plot quests. Which means I get a bunch of bonus out of this. Bam. And actually, I can complete either one of these. I'm going to play Takeover Rival Organization. Because it will actually reward me with some rogues right back, so I will still have plenty in here. So let's do that. It will drain my money, which means I might not, I won't be able to build something right away, but I think that's going to be fine. All right, we're good there. Tax collecting. Each opponent... Oh, you do have the option now to play four gold to get some victory points, but I don't have enough anyway. And I don't 
know if I would want to. I kind of still need my gold for things. I could still go to Waterdeep Harbor. I'm thinking... I don't want any of these quests. I'm thinking I run to the, the uh, Aurora's Realm Shop. It will give me options to possibly build something next turn, although I'll be short one gold. It also gives me an extra rogue. I do have a lot of them, but that's okay. Or do I play on Waterdeep Harbor and then pick up a quest or the money? I don't remember. What do I have? I mean, I could just play Conscription. Because there are some stuff that may need wards. I don't need a ton. But you know what? We'll get a little extra bang for a buck. And I'm not worried about being short on whatever. So I'm going to play Conscription. I got two warriors. Because sure. And I'll give a warrior to uh, Lairol over here again. Not doing as well. So it's fine. Um, I do have the ability to complete this quest here. And I don't see any reason not to do that. Sure. We'll do this. We'll actually get some extra priests, which will give us a few more options. Uh, we're running a little lower on rogues, but we have good ways to generate rogues. Both from our buildings, as well as... Um, well, we could play on our own buildings or get a freebie from someone using our building. We will hopefully still be first player. We'll see. And yeah, I'm really hoping this tile here stays open. So I was either going to go for money. I suppose I could always go to the plinth or run one of these as well. A piety quest? I could pick that up. That's actually a really good quest over here. 20 points. Needs rogues and priests. I mean, we've got the, a bit of a rogue-centric engine going on. Uh, so that's great, actually, because now I don't have to worry about resetting the quest. In fact, I'd be much happier playing in this slot here, which is exactly what I'm going to do. Um, yeah, that, that building's used. So I'm going to play this one which allow me to pick up this quest and get another Intrigue card. Boom. I've got the Priests, I've got the Rogues. I'm short one gold coin to complete it, but that's going to be fine because we can do that next round. Uh, what was my Intrigue card? Oh, we got a Mandatory Quest! So Mandatory Quest is a card you can play on your opponents. You give them this quest and they're not allowed to complete any other quest until they complete this one, which tends to be worth very few rewards. I'm going to have to give this to Oberyn, who is running away with the goddamn game. Now, again, we're hoping that we are going to get a lot of bonus points for completing our piety slash skullduggery quests over here. Although, they might be accumulating a lot of those as well. So, I would like, as my first move, to play on my own building over here, Helm Star's Warehouse, because I need rogues. It'll give me money, and it'll trigger both my plot quests, which will give me even more money and even more rogues. I could immediately complete this quest. Again, I don't have to. I could wait. Maybe there's other options. Maybe I'll want the money to purchase a building. Um, New Olin would still be pretty great to pick up, especially it's worth three victory points. I don't have enough money right now. But let's. I'm going to go ahead and wait. Because if I can use Aurora's Realm Shop, we'll see. Actually, what I think we're going to do is I'm going to play at Waterdeep Harbor. And we'll use Fend Off the Bandits. And we're going to play that on Oberyn. So he can't complete one of the quests he's probably hoping to play until he finishes this one. Not that it's necessarily the hardest, but it will drain three of his things out of there as well. Oh, which he doesn't have. He's going to have to pick up some warriors to do it. Again, I could complete this quest, but I'm going to hold off for now. You only play one quest per turn, so if you have a bunch of them, you know, you're going to have to not sit on them. But for now, we're okay. There's another piety quest over here, which... Um, I will need some more priests if I'm going to finish both of these. It gives you a bunch of warriors, not much in the way of actual rewards. Yeah, I don't really care about this one. Not particularly helpful. Oh, there you go. He's completing his mandatory quest. But yeah, you know, eat some of his resources. It doesn't give him much in the way of victory points. That's going to be okay. Um, I could play Change of Plans, but I want to complete this quest, so no. Um, the Builder's Hall is still available. That's an interesting question. Because if I do this, I get three victory points from completing this, which isn't, you know, nothing. 
And it's another rogue tile that I could use either myself or if someone uses it, then I can get a few that way. Still, I don't know if there's enough game left to really justify this. I think, in fact, I'm going to play on one of these two cards. Probably the money one. Yeah, because I need more money than rogues. And what the hell, let's, let's complete this. Brings me up to 51, but again, I've got bonus points waiting for me. Now you can... Um, I thought here... Oh, if I click here, you can get a breakdown of everyone's situation a little bit more. Um, in a bunch of different ways. You can get a quest log. Or, no, sorry, a uh, uh, gameplay log, game log to everyone's actions. So you can get a lot of extra info here. I think it's, like, remarkably well done here. So we're going to keep playing. This video is going to be a bit longer than usual here. But we're nearing the end. We've only got two more rounds of play. Although, the later rounds tend to, you know, because you get the extra tokens and maybe there's more stuff on the board, tend to be a little bit more thinking involved. Thin the City Watch. Oh, it gives you a bunch of rogues as a reward. Um, when I get my pawn back from Waterdeep Harbor, I think what I'm going to do is reset and pick a quest. The Waymoot has been built. That's interesting, because if you play on here, you get, um, you get three, vi well, it accumulates victory points. It's got three now. It's actually, oh, being first is going to be quite good, because it's going to have six victory points at the start of next turn here. Um, and it might be worth doing, even though it gives you one or two victory points. Still, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and blow up the quest track. And hopefully get something useful out of this. Uh, there's another piety quest over here. But it's not really great, is it? Once at the start of each round, take a supply. But, I mean, that I'm only going to get to take this advantage of this once. It's not worth any victory points. Um, what I'm going to do, I could take it, I'm actually going to take this Warfare qu uh, quest, which is worth a ton of points, just to deny it from someone else. And then what I can do is I can blow it up with my change of plans. But yeah, I was really hoping to get an actual useful quest for us, because it would be good to complete them. All right, we are in fact still player one. There are six, six victory points to be taken from this. And if we do this, we can also pick up a quest, but there's no good quest to pick up. Not for me. Someone else will probably play it, and that's going to be the way that it's going to be. Um, do I want to start by playing at Waterdeep Harbor? Do I want to start by blowing up the quest list again? That might be the way to go. Or I might want to start by playing on my own Helmstar's Warehouse because it does such a huge bonus thing for me. Because I get four money and three rogues from one action. Which is pretty good. See, there's, there's, there's ideas for everything. I mean, I will want to play on Waterdeep Harbor, but I don't necessarily have to rush this. I could build a building, but I think it's a little late for that. Although this one is worth four victory points now. No, I think the idea is I'm going to play on this before someone else does. Get a bunch of resources that will hopefully allow me to complete a quest. And then I'll probably have to do the request, reset quest thing here. But I'll probably play Waterdeep Harbor first. Because someone might... Um, someone else might take a quest and reveal something that I am interested in. Ooh, someone just completed a very valuable quest here. You see, it starts to get a little tighter, because the, the pace at which people make their points can vary a lot. I'm going to do this. Play Change of Plans. Use it to blow up this Warfare quest. Which, I mean, I guess I could just complete, but... Um, this is okay. This is fine. Get the six. It does give the option to my opponents to discard a quest. Um, and get three victory points each. But that doesn't concern me as much. Someone did play Waymoot. I was hoping that a, a good quest that I was interested in would reveal itself and I'd still be able to play on the Waymoot. But apparently not. House of Good Spirits someone is using. Mm -hmm. So on my turn, I'm going to blow up the quest list and try to pick up something here. I'm feeling a little quest-starved. 
more buildings being built. Smuggler's Dock is cool. Because you get, you get four tokens of some combination of Warrior and Rogue. Spend two gold, get four adventurers in some combination. All right, so we blow up the list. We get this. Um, once per round, whenever you take... Yeah, that's not bad, but again, it might have been handier earlier. I'm going to take Eliminate Vampire Coven over here. It's going to be... I do need the priests, but it's a decent reward. It gives us money, too, which is kind of interesting. I don't really need the money. But we'll take that. I think it's viable to complete. Um, what we can probably do is use the three pearls here. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And I... Oh, nope, someone used it. And I was going to say, I'm going to do a cool trick with it, because I was going to turn in two rogues and get one rogue and two priests. Because I get a rogue, it would trigger and give me two money from the quest. But I can't do that. Now the question is, do I want to just go to the plinth? There's this wild card here, but it gives victory points. House of Good Spirits is another way to get a priest. Um, hang on, we're going to use... Oh, no, the House of the Moon has been used already. Hmm... Because that would have been good, because picking up, uh, install a spy in what, Castle Waterdeep. This is something I would have wanted at the start of the game. Whenever you complete a Skulldug request, you score two. But you need this built before you complete the quests. Um, still, it would be something that would be really easy for me to complete. I might be able to do both next turn. It's going to be tough. Let's figure this out. I need to be able to pick up just two priests next turn. That's it. Yeah, okay, I can do that. So, let's pick you up, <coughs> grab the Skullduggery, and as long as I pick up two priests, I can complete two quests next turn. I'll also get an Intrigue card from this, if it matters. Uh, conscription for some more warriors, which I don't need. Now, I can run this right away, which I guess is fine. Yeah, that's totally okay. Next turn. If I can use um, the three pearls, then I can get my priest right away. And I think that's going to have to be my opening move. Because it's the easiest way to do it. And then we'll see if we can sneak in another card. But I this for sure. So, I'm going to pay for this by spending two rogues. Um, you know what? How do I... There we go. Um, I really don't need the warriors, do I? Oh no, I need two for this. Never mind. So we got to save two warriors, which is what's going to happen. Then I'm going to take a rogue because it will give me money. You do get some victory points for every three or five money or something like that. I'm not sure, but you do get some amount of it. Um, you also get one victory point for every agent or every adventure you have left in your tavern at the end of the game. So they're not wasted exactly. There we go, and I can complete this, which I may as well do now. It's not like I have a better quest presenting itself here. And end. And so now it's going to be about using my last two tokens to try to squeeze in uh, a few extra victory points. Most likely... Well, I might be able to sneak one of these quests here. Um, actually, this would be good. Four reward, plus put a building into play, I could play New Olam. That would mean this would be a nine victory point quest. I'm short a warrior, though. Although there are two turns. And it seems very unlikely that I couldn't get a warrior. On the other hand, there's another Skulldug request here, but I cannot get the rogues and the mages in time. I think the best thing I can do is pick up this quest, and then try to complete it, but uh, there's actually three different ways that I could get two warriors. Okay, yeah, that's fine then. Because I was going to or I only need one warrior, actually. Because um, I was going to say, maybe I want to pick up the warriors in, in case I can't complete the quest. At least if I pick up useless warriors, they're worth, you know, a victory point at the end. Oh, I forgot. I actually have... Yeah, this is going to be perfect. Uh, so we're going to acquire this. I have an Intrigue card that will give me warriors. So that's going to be the way to go. 
because we've got the rogue. We've got... Oh, we don't have the priest. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. So, hold on. I'm going to have to run the House of Good Spirits then. Because I need a warrior and a priest to complete that. So, I'm going to start by playing this. And hope that that card is still there. Because I need this card. Because I need exactly this combination. Although... There's a lot of different ways for me to get a priest, right? There's the plinth, there's the house of the moon, house of good spirits. Okay. I'm going to grab this first. Because I can play my intrigue card to get a warrior and then get another token back that I can use to get a priest. So either way, I should be able to complete this. End my turn. I got another intrigue card as well, but... Well, hey, two wild cards. Although I'd prefer playing Conscription, I think. So, there's a possibility that all the all the priest tokens goes away, but that's pretty unlikely. So I'm going to play Conscription because only one opponent will get an extra warrior. And I just want to check... You could use warriors, really. You could use warriors. You don't need warriors, so I'm going to give it to you. Still worth the victory point. There you go. So then when I get my token back, I'll be able to play it on something that'll give me a priest, which will let me complete this quest. Yeah, whenever you complete a warfare quest, again, two extra victory points. And it's unfortunate those came at the end. But at least it comes to the end for everyone. Well, that's a 20-point quest! Is that for Oberyn? It's a 93. That's not good. Okay, so I got my character back. Um, so, what's the absolute best way for me to get a priest? Who owns this? Lero does. Oh, she said 111! Oh, crying out loud. Yeah, I think the best way is just for me to play on the plinth. without giving an extra victory point to frickin' the person in the goddamn lead. Who, if you recall, had the lowest points for a long time. I'm gonna play this quest, which is not Skullduggery or Piety. Uh, I'm gonna use it to get New Olam for free, which will give me the five victory points that are on there. I mean, this, this is a nine victory point quest, which, I mean, I would have preferred something else, but I guess it's the way to go. All right, and that is the end of the game. So now there's going to be bonus points given out for remaining money and um, and adventurers and then our hidden stuff. Now I know I got a fair number of points from the hidden mask, but I'm willing to bet it's not going to be enough here. So it looks like you get one victory point for every two gold, which is pretty good. I completed six quests of my type, so I get 24 bonus points. That puts me only nine points ahead from Laryl over here. It seems really unlikely that I'm going to beat her. I was too concerned with Oberyn. Oh, we had the Builder one. Didn't do a super good job with it, though. Actually, this is the person I thought they had Skullduggery and were competing with me. No bonus money. Ah! Oh! So close. Yeah, I did not see that victory coming. And it's not like they did that well with their secret stuff. They just scored a bunch of high-end quests very near the end. Darn it. Oh, that's a good bonus there. So everyone is, like, relatively close, right? Between uh, highest and lowest. There's only a 14-point gap. So nice and tight there. A little bit of an unexpected twist at the end. I'm really disappointed that we're short by five points. I bet you I could have squeezed it in there somewhere. But anyway, that is a game of Lords of Waterdeep. Um, if you do play with the expansion, what it does is it adds... Um, each expansion adds an extra board, a little mini board, with three locations. Because the Undermountain has three locations here. Uh, Skullport adds three locations. Undermountain also adds this mechanic where some of the intrigue cards and buildings and whatever will actually cause you... Here, here's an example. Shadow Dust Cold. You play it, it gives you four rogues when you use it, which is amazing. And then you place one rogue 
on two different action spaces. You put like a rogue on the plinth and a rogue on the field of triumph. And then the next time someone uses this location, they get the two warriors and that one rogue token that was sitting there. Um, so that mixes it up. That's part of the Undermountain Skullport. Um, these locations are super powerful. Look at this, two warriors, two rogues, and a corruption token. Skull Island, two of anything, and a corruption token. Corruption tokens are here. As you do this, let's say I go ahead and uh, do the slaver's market. You'll see I'll take that token away. It's got this minus one exposed. Every time you take a corruption token, you take it from this track. And once one of these hexes is empty, then that number is exposed. So once, when three more corruption tokens go, that'll turn into a minus two, three more, minus three, etc., etc. Corruption tokens are worth negative points at the end of the game. And how much they are worth depends on what's exposed. Let's say the negative five is exposed here, right? So we've removed all these skulls and the negative five is empty. Each skull, each corruption token that you have is worth negative five points, which means if you've got like six corruption tokens, it means you're sitting at negative 30 points at the end of the game from that. Also, if the corruption track is ever empty and you have to take a corruption token, you lose instantly 10 points for each corruption token you were not able to pick up, which is brutal. However, there are some quests that will allow you to return corruption tokens from your tavern to the corruption track. There are buildings, see this is a building that gives you corruption, but there are buildings that will let you also return corruption to the corruption track. There are certain things that allow you to remove corruption from your tavern from the game. There's also the crossover mechanic here where there are some things which cause you to put corruption tokens on action spaces, which can screw people up. Uh, there are also more lords. I don't know if we got a new one over here. No, this is one of the baseline ones here. Um, there are more lords that get introduced with each expansion, new buildings, new quest, new intrigue cards as well. Did we get uh, one that we might be able to demonstrate? Oh yeah, voice responsibility here. I take a corruption track, put it in my tavern, um, but then give away a mandatory quest to someone else, someone else with a corruption token. So it's it's actually a great, interesting mechanic that actually adds a little bit more interaction with other players between placing things on the board and the corruption mechanic, uh, which there's another, for example, there's an intrigue card that gives everyone with more corruption than you one extra corruption token. So if you manage your corruption, you can really get yourself in a position where you can hose your, um, hose your opponents hard. So, uh... Great little game, one, consistently one of the top rated games on BoardGameGeek.com in real life, and in my opinion, a very uh, high quality digital implementation. Again, some of the UI um, um, sort of language or UI constructs that were used are clearly the sort of thing that you would use in a mobile kind of interface, but I don't find it annoying in any way on PC, so kudos to them, well played, and uh, yeah. So, hope you enjoyed this video, thanks for watching. See you guys next time.